And now, Latinos Progresando is proud to welcome to the stage our 2022 Mex Talks headliner, Luis Valdez. Luis Valdez is an internationally acclaimed and celebrated playwright and director who is often called the father of Chicano film and theater. His many works like Zoot Suit and La Bamba reflect a necessary and powerful Mexican voice. As one of the founders of the renowned El Teatro Campesino, known for being the culture arm of the United Farm Workers and the Chicano movement, Luis Valdez's vision and craft has transcended his work to that of a true revolutionary art. I've always believed that theater is a creator of community and that community is a creator of theater. Every community, regardless of economic status, should have access to a theater. I am the ballad. The ballad sings. And my voice is of the streets, and the cantinas, and the dance halls, and all the places where I am heard. For I am the soul of the common people that sings of tragedies and melancholy, but also Happiness. Please join us in giving a warm Chicago Hola, welcome to the one and Alejandro. only Luis Valdez. Buenas noches. <laughs> ¿Cómo están todos? Bien? Qué bien. It's such a pleasure to be here again uh, in Chicago on Michoacan Avenue. <laughs> I've always enjoyed that link between Michigan and Michoacan. It's the same word, verdad? <laughs> the place of the fish. Y aquí está toda la raza pescando. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? All right. Well, I want to thank uh, Mex Talks, me Tocayo Luis Gutierrez, and all the wonderful staff for this opportunity to come and speak to you tonight. What a what a pleasure. What a, what an honor, especially in this lineup of such talented, intelligent leaders and artists and the future. Me llena de regocijo y de orgullo poder estar aquí con ustedes y con tanta juventud because our future depends on the young people. I'm going to share a couple of little stories with you. Um, actually, I was born in 1940 in California. My folks came out of Sonora. They were yaquis once upon a time. And they came to uh, Arizona, to Tucson, and Mesa, and they were doing whatever they could, picking, working in the mines, picking cotton. Eventually, they made their way to California in the 1920s uh, to create basically King Cotton and King Grape. The big corporations were getting started, and they needed labor, and so they used the trains to truck in La Raza to come in and develop the agribusiness. You know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry in Khalifa, and, and it's on the backs and on the sweat and on the goodwill of los trabajadores, los campesinos. So I was born in a labor camp, a farm labor camp in Delano, California. And uh, it was my, actually it was my grandmother's little shack and my mother went there and uh, she took me there before they tore the camp down. They put Highway 99 right through there, right through the barrio. But anyway, I was born there, and uh, a year later, uh, a family moved in across the street from that labor camp uh, the, to one of my tias and, and into one of the cabins that belonged to one of my tias. And uh, it was a fam family from uh, Yuma, Arizona, from Yuma, Arizona. And they were the Chavises, and there were two teenage boys. One uh, was called Sisi, and the other was called Rookie. And so they turned out to be Cesar and Richard Chavez. And uh, so that link, you know, right across the street, there it is, has, has defined my life. You know, sometimes 
Uno no conoce su destino, but if life puts you in a, you know, punches you in the face or, or gives you a kick, you know, you'd find your destino pretty quick. And so, but uh, I didn't, wasn't there to receive, and I was only one year old because we were already on the migrant path. I was on the migrant path before I could walk. I was in my mother's arms like a lot of campesino babies, you know, sleeping in a fruit box, you know, in the fields. And then we were staying in a, a little barn, uh, in a little town in, uh, in Northern California, picking prunes. And my tío and my tía were there with my cousins, and we were there. They moved the cows out and moved the Mexicans in. <laughs> and so uh, we, we used to cook. My mother and my, my tía used to cook on a tina, a tin tub, with a hole cut in the side. It was a portable kitchen, man. It was a portable grill. And so it used to ride on top of the truck real easy. It was, heavy, it was light. And so that morning, uh, that, that one morning, they were there cooking. And, and, and un descuido, you know, that someone was careless. And, and they didn't notice that I was crawling around. And I had a little cousin, a little baby girl who came. She was starting to walk. And someone had put a little pan, una tinita, you know, of water. Uh, and and uh, in un momento, uh, yeah, I, my Cousin grabbed the handle and she found it really hot and she lost it and uh, dropped it and it fell on my back. And uh, I screamed and I don't remember this, you know, but they tell me. And I passed out. My mom and dad came running. They wrapped me up in a blanket and they took me to the nearest hospital in a little town called Gilroy, you know, garlic capital of the world. And, uh, and when they got to the hospital, they opened up the blanket and all of the skin on my back sloughed off. And my mother was really scared to death, 20 years old, pobrecita. And she had just lost the baby before me, my, another brother that I had who died. And so she said, mijo, te estabas muriendo, you know. And so they took her into the emergency. There was no burn unit or anything. It's 1941. This is before Pearl Harbor. And we were Mexicans. We were migrant workers, you know. So they put some kind of treatment on my back and, and released me. I, I guess today I'd be in a burn unit. I'd be in the ICU, uh, in the... ER, you know, I, 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 they would have taken care. But in those days, that was the way it was. And it's both good and bad, you know, that they released me. I've always believed that you can take the negatives in your life and turn them into something positive. And this was my first real experience because two things happen. On the one hand, that water that hit me, that boiling water, the aguirriente, hit me right here in the back and uh, scalded me, but se me echó la pompa andar, you know what I mean? <laughs> it really, it was a wake up call. It was more than a kick in the ass, man. It was a wow, jodazo, you know, with hot water. And, and the other thing though, is that for the next six months, I slept on my mother's stomach. 20 years old, she was afraid that I would roll over, mi mamacita, holding me. And I, in, I took in all that love that she was giving me. There's nothing like mother's love. Nothing. You know, mothers are blessed things. And so they, they, they empower their kids. And so my mother did that. And she had 10 kids. You know, I was only number two or number three, really, but two out of 10 kids, five brothers, five sisters. But my brothers and sisters always felt a little bit jealous of me because, you know, my mom, you said, you, you, you were always our favorite. But that's not true. But the thing is that she did empower me, you know. She did empower me. So after the war of 46, we're still on the migrant path. And this is when I got hooked in the theater because uh, what we were doing is picking cotton. And, uh, you know, the cotton season came and went like that because there were thousands of people of all colors, man. There were blacks from the South. There were the Japanese that were coming out of the concentration camps, Chinese even. You know, there were white people. Okies were out there. I thought everybody was a cotton picker, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Todos son, son piscadores, you know. So the cotton season went like that, man. And we couldn't move on out of the labor camp because my dad's truck was, uh, was broken down. We had a little pickup truck. So he had it up on blocks. And, and, you know, we're living hand to mouth, hand to mouth. And so what happened is we're living off of the fish. Talk about place of the fish. Uh, at the San Joaquin Delta in, 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 in California, we used to fish and, and, and uh, take them home to my mom. And we were eating fish tacos before they were trendy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so one, one morning, uh, you know, I almost drowned. I fell in the river, and uh, fortunately, my dad uh, reached me, el pelo, you know, pulled me out like a fish. 
And so my mother got really scared, and she said, maybe you and your brother better go to school, because the school bus used to come into the camp. So we went to school, and she found the little brown paper bag, and there were paper shortages in 1946. But she used to make the tacos de tortilla, you know, the, the harina, and our fish tacos, or once in a while, eggs, if you can find them, beans. And that's what I took to school, you know? Me daba vergüenza, really, because they had no cafeteria, but the Anglo kids had uh, lunch boxes, you know? Metal boxes and, and sandwiches. Yo con mis tacos, you know? Uh, I, I used to eat them the way, the way a wino drinks his, his wine, you know? So, you know. Mm. <laughs> the kids would say, what are you eating? No, 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 nothing, nothing, you know? One day, one day, uh, uh, they, they kept looking at me, and I kept looking at the sandwiches, and they, I kept looking at my tacos, and I kept looking at this, and we exchanged lunches. And the rest is Taco Bell history, you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what happened is that one day I went to get my bag, I was gonna take it back to my mom, and, the, and I wasn't there, it wasn't in the closet. And I, the teacher saw me running around, como loco, you know, she says, uh, what happened? And I said, I told her, oh, a little brown paper bag. She said, yeah, she said, I took it. So, let's well, give it back. <laughs> and she says, I can't. And she escorted me back into a little room behind her desk. And there was my bag, all ripped up, floating in a basin of water. I said, se volvió loca la maestra. You know what I mean? She went berserk. But no, and she said, look at this. And she picked up a little piece, dipped it into some paste. And the first time I noticed the mold, it was a face, it was an animal, a monkey. And then she put another piece on, smoothed it out, another piece smoothed it out. And at that point, she says, you want to try it? I said, yeah, what are they, okay, you know? And at that moment, I discovered one of the secrets of the universe. It's called paper mache. <laughs> and I said, what, it's past Halloween, it's already November, what, well, what is this for? And she said, uh, it's for a play. And the whole school's involved, it's called Christmas in the Jungle, and we need two first graders to play monkeys. Was I stole it, my mom knows, yeah. And so I forgave her about the bag, I auditioned, and I got my first role in the theater, it was amazing. She made a beautiful mask out of my mama's taco bag, you know? She, it was, she painted it, and I got a costume that was better than my own clothes. I mean, I, I had uh, a little green vest, you know, red pants, you know, in a corner, you know, and then little shoes, a little hat, you know? Man, I was in heaven, and I, 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 they converted the old school auditorium into uh, a jungle, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't wait to go to school. This is great. So we were rehearsing, and then I came back from school the week of the show, about early in the week, it was about a Monday or Tuesday, <clears throat> and my mom says, we're leaving tomorrow. I, we're, what, I, ma, the, the show's on Friday, you know? I, and she says, I know, but we're being evicted, mijo. We're being thrown out, we gotta go. Pues lloré, you know what I mean? I ran out crying, she cried with me. And the next morning, I was in the back of the pickup truck, you know, with my brothers and sisters, as we pulled out and passed by the school in the San Joaquin fog, and I felt this hole open up in my chest. I thought I was gonna be destroyed, you know, again. But I've always believed that a positive, you know, can, a negative can be turned into a positive because that hole became the hungry mouth of my creativity. I took with me the secret of paper mache, my unrequited love of the theater, and also anger, residual anger, because we had been evicted from the labor camp. Approximately 20 years later, I went to Cesar Chavez, and I pitched him the idea for a theater of, by, and for farm workers, El Teatro Campesino. It was born out of the dreams of a child, a campesino child. I was speaking to a bunch of superintendents years later, and the present superintendent of that school district in the San Joaquin Valley of the Stratford School District heard me speak and he went back and checked his records and he sent me a, a mimeograph copy of the attendance record of 1946, first grade. And there on the bottom says Louis Valdez. The kid was in school for 30 days. That was it. I was a migrant kid in and out, but it shaped my life. And at the top of the page is the name of the teacher, Ruth Tremaine. And God bless her. She must be about 50, 150 years old by now, but you know. <laughs> but she launched my career. So I've always told teachers, you never know who you're teaching. You never know who you're inspiring. And as a teacher myself, I feel that way about my students. I don't care how old they are or how young or old, it's always the same. You never know who you're talking to because our destiny and the creator puts these opportunities before us. Your life 
is full of opportunity. Your life is full of treasures. Your life is full of power if you only know how to pull it out. Now, speaking of campesinos, you know, we, we have suffered uh, the greatest disgrace because of the la calumnia, you know, the calumny, the, the distortion that they put on the people that work in the fields. Now, over here, uh, in most of the industrialized world, workers are wage slaves, you know. They work in the factories, they pluck chickens, they, they cut up meat, or, or, or they work in the fields, or they wash dishes, and they're considered to be mano de obra, you know, you're just working hands. But in campesinos in Mexico were a lot more than that. You know, agriculture did not develop all over the world, you know. It developed in the areas where there was water, where there was fertility. And one of the wonders of Mexico is our agricultural treasures, is what we created. You know, what we created. The, the camote, the sweet potato, saved China from starvation once it was discovered and taken to Asia. Just like the potato from the Incas saved Europe and Russia. This, these are American creations, the indigenous, that have fed the world, but we don't get any credit for it. And we don't get credit for the hydroponic system that our pre-Columbian ancestors had. We don't get credit for knowing something about the relationship between the stars and the seasons and when to produce enough food to create cities of 100,000 people. They are discovering there were a lot of them all over Mexico. Mexico is a treasure. You know, if people go to Europe, they got to know about Rome. They got to know about the Greeks. But people come to the Americas and they don't know about the Rome and the Greeks of the New World. Those are our people. And so it has been my mission. You can applaud. Dale, dale, guys, you know. <clears throat> so it has been my mission as a poet and as a writer, as a filmmaker, as a man of the teatro, is to understand what it is that we're doing. I have a new book out called Theater of the Sphere, The Vibrant Being. It's, it's, you can find it on Amazon. You can look it up. I recommend it to you. It's not just for theater people because it's a way of life based on the ideas of our ancestors. Okay, Juan Carlos Dalegas. Okay, we're gonna see some images up here from the book. I'm gonna go flip through them real quick because I want to refer them. This is uh, the title page, one of the titles, not the cover of the book, but a title page. And you can see we have the Huelga Eagle there. One of the reasons I wanted to start with this because the interlocking eagles, you know, represent four movement, cuatro movimiento. But you know what's interesting is the, the, the flag was designed by Richard Chavez and he put five steps on it. So what's interesting about this is five in the Mayan mathematical system is, is represented by a line. It's a dot bar system. And so it, it's very much like our, our, our zeros and ones today. You know, the Mayas were way out there. But the thing is that if you compute and, and add the five, 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 and five, you get 20, 20. Okay, next slide, we go up. And this is more familiar. This is, this is now we olin. This is, this is cuatro movimiento. Now, this is the essence, you know, of, of the dynamic philosophy of our ancestors. We understand the symbols, but you've got to understand them with your whole being. And this is why I have made this a study, and we have worked with the Teatro Campesino for more than 50 years to, to learn and elucidate all these thoughts. Next slide, por favor, Juan Carlos. And uh, the, uh, our ancient ancestors, this is Hunabku, el único dador de la medida y el movimiento. But you know, all of the ceremonial center, 400 cities of stone in Mesoamerica are based on this design. It's also the circle in the square. But you can see the pyramids, they had a shape and they were lined up to the stars because they were, in fact, children of the stars. You know, I, I once uh, toured uh, the Lucas Ranch with George Lucas, you know, he's a friend, filmmaker, and, and, and this is, of course, after Star Wars. But he went to this library, and I was amazed that his library, he has a three-story library in the, in the Lucas Valley Ranch, he had all kinds of books about the Maya. And he, the term Star Wars comes from the Maya. The Maya fought battles according to the stars. They gave birth according to the stars because they were calibrating the, according to the universe. Well, it's an interesting that Star Wars became a world-famous movie. But it's a Mayan concept. You should know that because it's part of your culture. Moving on, por favor. Next. This is this is this is then this is this is Hunabku. 
the square inside the circle. Move on, please. Next. Next slide. Here we go. Now, what this refers to is the two calendars. The sacred calendar is the, the medium circle there. And this is the solar calendar, 360 days. And then we have the Tzolkin, the sacred calendar, which is 260 days. What's interesting about 260 days is that you add it up, and it's equivalent to the nine months that a child spends in the mama's womb. That's why they needed to have the sacred calendar, because this calibrates human behavior according to the solar calendar. Now, they say that the Mayas were of Stone Age people, that they didn't have the wheel. Well, what is this? <laughs> this, is, this is the cosmic wheel. They understood wheels. Are you kidding me? This is our people. You know, we were led to believe that we can't do anything, that we don't understand anything. But there it is. Next slide, please. So we took the 20 days of the Solkin and broke them apart. This is the solar calendar, the Chab, and this is the sacred calendar of the Tzolkin. What does that have to do with us? These are the 20 pasos that we have used in order to explore the physical and philosophical language of our ancestors. Next slide, please. Next slide, here we go. And this is how we broke it down. This is all in the book. This is why I, I don't want to spend too much time, but you can read about this. 20 days of the Sokin, the Mayan sacred calendar. 13 months of 20 days each for 260 days. Four columns. Next slide, please. Next slide. And we have taken these then and broken them down into what they mean. The body, imish. Imish is pregnant womb. Ik is breathing. Akbal is flow like water. Kan is balance. Chikchan is gather all your life strength like a serpent and move and move. Because everything is a spiral. Everything is a spiral. So we've studied the language of our ancestors in the teatro. And this is the only way that you can do it. You can't sit on your butt and study a book. You got to move. Okay? Naki estoy. I'm 82 years old, folks. Mira. Okay? And then all of this relates to the heart. Kimi. Kami is death, because fear of death is where it begins, where you begin your feelings. And then, banik, lamat, muluk, ok. Ok, number 10 here is love. So you, you go from fear of death to love as you develop your heart. Ok. Backwards, you turn it inside out, the minds used to do this, is ko, which means serpent, which is God. Now, the English word for God, inside out, turns into dog. Dog, God. Ok, ko. Okay, the mind, chuen, the monkey. This is why it's coincidental that my first role in the theater was a monkey, because it's a sign of intelligence. All the way down to men, which is creer, crear, hacer. Creer, crear, hacer. And you know, my maestro, Domingo Martinez Paredes, I'll show you a picture of him, revealed to me that the word amen, that we pray all over the world, amen. What does it mean? In Maya Yucateco, it means your creation. Amen. Y aquí está el men. Okay, means creer, crear, hacer, con dolor, amor y dolor. And then finally, the spirit or the soul. Kib kaban esnab kawakahau. Kib, you got to believe in something bigger than yourself. Kaban, Mother Earth. You got to believe in Mother Earth. Mother Earth because she's alive. Esnab, speak the truth. This is all moral. This is morality. Kawak, you turn yourself inside out. Giving birth is turning yourself inside out. And what's curious here is that WAC, U-A-C, is number six. And they have palindromes, which means that you can take a word and turn it inside out. So kawak, coming and going, is the same word. It's number six turned inside out. And then finally, ahau, which is flower. We flower at the end of 20 pasos. Now, this is a whole way of life. But this is a philosophy that was given to us by our ancestors 
but you need to apply it physically and in action and in relationship to your community with your brothers and sisters in your family and your brothers and sisters in your community. Moving on, please, one more. And the ball game, ulama or piktapok or pits. Uh, it, you can see the ancient symbols and then the modern players because they're still playing it in Sinaloa. They're playing this game, ulama. Very important. You know, this is uh, the game required putting a rubber ball through a hole in a, in a circle. Again, they say we didn't have the wheel. Well, the wheel's all over the ball courts. And the thing is that they use vulcanized rubber. They used to vulcanize the rubber by putting ashes, human ashes, into the rubber. It wasn't Goodyear that discovered vulcanization. It was the Maya 2,000 years ago. You know, they used to make raincoats. They used to make medicine out of rubber. So discover the treasures of your people. Discover the treasures of America. And so moving on, please. One more. And you can use these soccer balls. These are all pictures. And soccer, this is the big rubber ball, the original one. There's hard rubber from the Maya, and we use rubber balls in, when we do this at the teatro. We have number five or number four soccer balls. And you know, when they played the ball game, it was like playing basketball without being able to use your hands. And playing soccer without being able to use your feet. All they had was their cadera. That's how they, that's how they knocked the ball through. You know, the, the game is coming back in Mexico. People are beginning to play it again. But what this does, it whips your spine. It whips your spine. And when you whip your spine, you send a current all the way up to the base of your skull. And you become more intelligent. You become more aware. You become more alive. And this gets me back to the child that I was back at one year old when that hot water hit me right here. And it's the Lord that burned the hell out of me to say, wake up, cabrón, wake up. Okay, moving on, one more. And this is what we do, we get on the ball, literally. So you, you learn how to work with the ball and, and you do the spiral. And you know, this becomes all the dance forms. It is ballet, it is hula, it is rock and roll, it is todo, you know, it's a U joint. You know what I'm saying? Aquí está, you know? Without this, there's no human race, you know? <laughs> so again, learn, learn your culture and learn where you're coming from because these, this is very deep. Our ancestors gave it to us. One more, please. And this is Domingo Martinez Paredes, my Mayan master who died in the 80s. He wrote the book. He wrote the books that I learned from him in the 1970s. I just want to give him honor. Give him honor for these ideas because he was the Mayan master that passed these ideas. <clears throat> I want to close, I want to close with a poem in three languages. We're bilingual. You know, if you're bilingual, the synapses on your brain learn to go boop, 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 boop. You know, this English only nonsense, you know? Forget it, one language is not enough. You gotta have at least two. Three or four or five would be really nice. You know, you can learn French, you can learn German. You know, all the cultures of the world are beautiful. Just because I celebrate my culture doesn't mean I don't appreciate European culture. We're speaking in English. I'm speaking in English, you know, I think so. <laughs> or Spanish, you know, fine. You know, we, we, we connect to the rest of Asia, incredible. Everything that you put into motion here begins to look like Asian martial arts because there's a link in Africa. The, the jungle was the Bible of, of African people, and they move, man. They're geniuses. This is why they're such great athletes, because they're in contact with their bodies. Okay, and then we need to, we've, we've already blended genetically, actually, in many areas, but we need to continue to learn from each other. And so, a poem in three languages. First, in Nahuatl, which is the Aztec language. Out, oh, Nahuatl. Klein mash ti kil na miki a kan machinem yan moyolo, ikti moyol se semana a week patikwika, in tlaltik pa kan mach titlaltiu. En español, ¿qué era lo que acaso tu mente hallaba? ¿Dónde andaba tu corazón? 
Por esto das tu corazón a cada cosa, sin rumbo lo llevas, vas destrozando tu corazón sobre la tierra. ¿Acaso puedes ir en pos de algo? And now in English, what is it that your mind was looking for? Where is your heart? For this you give your heart to everything? Your heart is without direction. You are destroying your heart. On this earth, do you suppose that you can go in search of anything and find it? That is a poem by Prince Nehuatzalcoyot of Texcoco in 14 something or other. Three languages. So the message is very clear. America, find your heart and discover the joy of being Mexican. Yeah.